together or drawing apart? Um, pulling together or drawing apart, that is indeed the question one asks oneself uh, when looking at EU and US trade and climate policy today. Um, on the one hand, the American Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, that was introduced uh, last autumn, has been hailed as the most significant news in the fight against climate change in 2022. Um, it includes a minimum $369 billion in energy security and climate change programs and seems to show that the U.S. is getting serious about environmental policy. Um, while this green aspect is, uh, of course, very welcomed in uh, the EU, uh, the IRA has also been perceived as an attempt to capture the EU's manufacturing base. Uh, particularly the condition that uh, tax breaks only count for the purchase of electric cars and batteries produced in North America has been heavily criticized. This creates incentives for European industry to relocate to the US, coming at a moment when Europe's competitiveness already suffers from high energy prices. Apart from that, observers have criticized uh, the IRA to lead towards an increasingly zero-sum game in trade and a further breakdown of WTO rules. Europeans also have underlined that there is a need for a united front in, in, uh, in times of geopolitical confrontation with Russia, while the US has criticized uh, some EU countries' uh, close ties to China. Furthermore, the EU has long been providing green subsidies too. In the framework of a variety uh, of initiatives, such as the uh, Recovery and Resilience Facility, Repower EU, Shore, the Green Transition Programs, and also programs on the national level. Furthermore, the EU has attempted to induce other countries to embark on greener policy with trade instruments, such as the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, and new rules on due diligence uh, for companies. But outside the EU, this has been criticized as a barrier to free trade, and as discriminatory, especially in the third world. So considering all these different views and approaches to trade and climate policy, what should be done and to build a truly integrated trade and climate agenda across the, uh, the Atlantic? And is this even possible? These are some of the questions uh, that we will address today uh, with our distinguished panel, uh, which is composed evenly by two Americans and two Europeans. Um, I will start uh, introducing um, Chad Baun, who is joined us from Washington online. He is a senior fellow uh, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, thank you very much for being here, Chad. Um, then I, um, I, I like to introduce to you Elitsa Garnizova, director of the Trade Policy Hub uh, of the LSE in London, to the very right. Um, uh, next to her, we have uh, Matthias Jorgensen, head of unit at DG Trade. Uh, he's concentrating on US and Canada trade relations, so he's very well placed uh, for this uh, discussion today. Um, and finally, last but not least, uh, we, I'm happy to introduce to you Peter Rashid, uh, Vice President and Director of the Geoeconomics Program of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at John Hop uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, who actually came all the way from Washington. So thanks for, to everyone for, for being here today. Um, I'm sure it will be a very lively discussion. Um, I will start by asking uh, uh, Matthias Jorgensen uh, from the EU Commission. Um, Matthias, can you, um, from a EU, EU Commission perspective, what is the current state of affairs in transatlantic negotiations on the IRA and trade and sustainability in general? And what do you think will happen next? Well, th thank you very much, uh, Phil, and thank you very much to the EPC for, for inviting me, and it's, it's a real honor for me to be here with such uh, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, and, um, and it's a great moment, I think, uh, to, to discuss this issue. Um, what, I want to, what I want to do today is to give you uh, some perspectives on, on this issue from a trade uh, policy point of view. 
um, it takes place, and I think that's important to underline uh, on a need for taking action on climate. I think everybody understands climate change is here. Well, the weather is terrible today, but uh, I'm not sure whether that's uh, due to climate change. But um, there, there are actions on both sides now uh, of the Atlantic. Um, there are very ambitious targets uh, on both sides. Uh, so uh, it's not surprising that if we look across the landscape of uh, transatlantic relations uh, related to trade, there are several aspects which are which are of importance. Basically, it's the uh, IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. It's the TTC uh, and it's the uh, GSA, the Global Steel and Aluminium Arrangement. Uh, discussions that we have with the U.S. So that's what I want to to try to focus on to give you a broad overview of where we see that the key junctures are in terms of uh, transatlantic discussions on on trade and sustainable and sustainability. Uh, as you said, uh, Philip, uh, the IRA is really uh, an important uh, development. Uh, it's uh, it's a climate step from the side of the U.S. Uh, the climate uh, the U.S. really becoming serious uh, in terms of uh, taking action on climate. And I think we welcome very much, shall we say, that uh, political uh, intention uh, behind it. And it's also quite clear that uh, there are there's lots of EU industry uh, who has welcomed uh, this, uh, this act um, in terms of, uh, of business or investment opportunities uh, in uh, the EU, sorry, in the US. And that's, of course, uh, very important because the trade and uh, investment relationship that we have with the US is so uh, important. But uh, we are quite worried about several of the elements uh, in, uh, in the IRA. And uh, I think that you can basically divide them up in, 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 three, uh, in three groups. Huh? And first of all, uh, we have a number of provisions in the IRA, and I think nobody's disputing that which discriminate uh, against uh, EU products uh, and EU continent goods. Uh, if, uh, if, they have, uh, if they don't have uh, uh, either American content or are subject to production in, uh, in, in North America, well, you know, then they cannot benefit from the IRA uh, subsidies. And that looks pretty clearly as a local content, uh, local content uh, provision, uh, which, is, uh, which, is not, which is not compatible with the WTO. The second problem we have is that uh, even if you uh, should say look aside from what is clearly uh, discriminatory, um, well, then the size of uh, the subsidies which are being provided in the uh, IRA, which you referred to, well, they're so big uh, that uh, we feel that, they, that there's a big risk of a cumulative adverse impact on, uh, on EU uh, economy and, uh, and competitiveness. For example, in terms of taking away uh, investment uh, in the green transition, uh, which we are looking forward to, or which we even may be uh, supporting inside the EU in a non-discriminatory manner, and, 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 and taking them over towards uh, the US. And that's of, course, um, that's, of course, of concern to us in so far as the green transition economy, green transition economic activities have really been identified as key for the development of the EU uh, in the years to come. And a third uh, element of concern is that uh, if the US um, decides to uh, go through and really uh, subsidize uh, the production uh, as much as it possibly could be the case under the IRA, well, uh, that will decrease the possibility, of course, of EU goods to compete on the US market, but also uh, uh, for EU goods to be competitive uh, in, in third country markets. And we've seen over the last couple of years that the impact of a trading uh, country, or well, China is a good example, when it starts subsidizing uh, its industry a lot, well, then there's a knock-on effect, which is negative for other trading partners' uh, position in, 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 in third countries, because they lose competitiveness due to the high level of subsidies. Um, so um, that's, that's, that's quite, I mean, that's quite, that's quite important, because I think what has happened is that uh, uh, we have a jolt to the system now, uh, uh, in terms of the IRA, uh, that I just set out now, and that is, if you look at the political debate, you can see that that has led to a uh, fundamental debate here inside the EU on uh, on how we approach our economy, on how we support our industry, 
and also I think on how we uh, will uh, or how we can protect uh, our market. And you can see that debate going on right now. If you read the news, you can see Commissioner EVP Vestager, uh, Breton, uh, EVP Dombrovskis, uh, uh, talking about it. Uh, what should the reply be? And it's going to be uh, clearly one of the key issues uh, in, in the European Council. And maybe more broadly, I think it puts the question of what should the EU do when it sees that the other big kids on the block, huh, uh, China and, and the US, are really starting to subsidize, but in both their manners, uh, uh, their industries uh, in a way that the EU is not uh, either willing to do, meaning in a discriminatory manner, or able to do due to uh, our state aid uh, rules. Um, I think we have to see how that pans out. Hmm? Uh, because uh, there's clearly a risk that uh, that we will have to take measures or that pol political decisions will be taken in the to not uh, uh, positive for you, U.S. Um, so, um, in addition to that, I think that's one broader concern in relation to the IRA, and that uh, we feel U.S. has. Uh, saying, you know, it's okay to do local content uh, uh, requirements to, to ask for those. We have made several WTO cases in the past. We have won several WTO cases in the past. And I don't know, together with the US. Now, uh, what will the US do if uh, a country, uh, well, we will start imposing local content requirements uh, for the production of cars or production of, of, of power stations for the production of bicycles, etc.? Um, there's a broader risk to the WHO system and, and the idea of rules-based trade. We will see how that pans out uh, uh, as it comes, but I think it's another uh, uh, um, general uh, is a reflection of a move away from the of the U.S. from, shall we say, the respect of multilateral rules and of a, of a rules-based trade system that that we that we uh, that we have seen over the last uh, couple of years. Now, what about uh, the Trade and Technology Council? Because I think it's the second important element. Well, the Trade and Technology Council, uh, something was really um, those of you who have a slightly longer uh, memory than the last uh, two, three years will know that um, until quite recently, our uh, relationship was really based very much or focused very much on, on disputes, aircraft, steel, and console issues. Um, but with the Trade and Technology Council, um, we have taken a step forward and said, yeah, not only on discourse, we have to change the discourse and we have to look at the opportunities. Because coming back to that basic issue, the EU-US trade for the economy on both sides and for lots and lots of people and stakeholders on both sides. So we have... Of course, we will have disputes, but we have a very strong uh, duty to nurture and try to move forward uh, in uh, in a positive uh, agenda. And there are many working groups in the TTC, but part of the focus on uh, of the TTC is also the green transition. And that's because we set up the TTC to increase bilateral uh, trade, but also to help us on the number of issues and some of those on key issue that we wanted to use the TTC as well. Now, what's the track record of the TTC uh, on sustainability? Um, it's mixed. Um, we were not able to pass the IRA uh, under the TTC, uh, even though uh, TTC had also been set up to avoid uh, trade uh, irritants or, or trade disputes. Um, what we do is use it to, uh, to mitigate some of the negative effects of the IRA, and we still uh, believe that it's very important to try to uh, to try to maybe avoid uh, um, another um, something something like the IRA. But we also want, and if you look at the uh, at the uh, conclusions from the last TTC in in, in Washington uh, just in, in in December, uh, we want to go further uh, and try to launch uh, something that for the moment goes under the name of uh, the Transatlantic Initiative on Sustainable Trade. So it's bang right into the subject that you've uh, asked us to discuss today, uh, Philip. 
Um, and uh, I think that's quite an exciting uh, initiative. Huh? Uh, we still have to work out what's going to be uh, in there, uh, but it's something that uh, was very welcomed. It was an idea that we came up with, but it was very welcomed uh, by the Americans. And I think that we will now here, uh, before the next TTC meeting, I think we're delivering on this idea and this concept will be a key uh, issue. We will be trying to fill out what is currently a blank page, but I think it will be about creating a strong and resilient uh, transatlantic uh, uh, marketplace or maintaining the, trans the, the resilience of the, of the transatlantic marketplace that we have and, and, and help us move forward in, in areas of, uh, of the green transition. Uh, but we're quite excited to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to get um, Now, uh, uh, sorry for being a bit long, uh, Philip, but uh, that will be the GSA uh, arrangement. Uh, very interesting uh, process. Uh, in fact, you know that we had, uh, or that the US took some measures on um, on, uh, on protecting its steel and aluminum industry based it on, uh, on national security concerns. Um, they just lost a W trade case on it, uh, by the way, not from us, uh, but but other people. But we agreed with the U.S. to to park that uh, dispute for for two years and say, well, uh, let's try to see uh, if we can get an agreed solution, on it. and let's try to see if we can use the uh, try to use the, the our efforts to solve this dispute to move forward on. Uh, decarbonizing the steel and aluminium sector. And that's important because if you look at the steel and aluminium sector, well, those two sectors alone are responsible for around 10 of, uh, you know, of industry. So that's going to be interesting. We uh, have a bit of a clock ticking there. We have to find a Okay, it's working, yeah. Um, but uh, so we are now uh, in a process in which we are really starting uh, the, the discussion with the U.S. to try to see whether we can find an agreement there uh, and, 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 and get uh, together the result that on the one hand will normalize trade on steel and aluminum between the EU uh, and the U.S. and on the other hand really give a push for the decarbonization uh, of this uh, of this sector, so with those introductory words, I mean there's lots of issues to uh, to uh, to to deal with, but uh, but thanks very much for for giving me the possibility to 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 start off. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias, for this very thorough overview. Um, it sounds like there is a lot of initiatives going on that uh, um, make the impression that you believe there is uh, still not all lost and there. Uh, can be more cooperation going ahead. Um, now uh, let's uh, turn to Chad. Um, maybe you can uh, give us an American perspective on uh, on the IRA. Uh, what's the politics behind it? What do you expect to happen? Um, and uh, yeah, well, what's your predictions for the future? Thanks. Um, let me just make sure that you can all hear me before I start. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so thanks for the invitation to be here. And it's always great to, to follow uh, Matthias as well, because he laid out uh, the issues so thoroughly, so so I won't need to go over them again in 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 too much detail. There now that they're out there, let me focus primarily on um, the Inflation Reduction Act and how I think um, I would like uh, my friends in in Europe to interpret it because I'm I'm not sure that it's being uh, messaged properly um, and interpreted properly. And even all that being said, it is still a moving target. And so you have to update your facts uh, all the time. And the reason why is this is not just U.S. administration policy. This is actively working with Congress. The Inflation Reduction Act was the result of compromise uh, in a narrow margin Congress to get anything done at all. Um, the Treasury Department has recently issued some regulations that have clarified some elements, have changed some of the facts on the ground considerably 
uh, from where we thought things were in the middle of December, their announcement on, I think it was December 29th on electric vehicles uh, is a major radical departure. This is not to say that there aren't still other elements of IRA that are, that are still challenging, but in any case, this is still a moving target. And I think what you have to consider is what the, at least what the administration's intentions are, which is not to start a fight with Europe on this issue, but to try to work collectively um, with allies, with like-minded countries, with trusted, resilient supply chain partner countries on the green transition. Now, that being said, we each face our own domestic political constraints. As Matthias already articulated, in Europe, you have a hard time subsidizing, right? State aid rules, constitution of the, uh, of the, of the European Union basically makes it, at least in current form, uh, impossible, discouraged, right? Which then ultimately funnels active policy on climate into what I, as an economist, love to see. First best, let's tax the bad stuff. You know, let's tax carbon. Let's put a price on carbon uh, and maybe have CBAM to deal with competitiveness effects. First best, first best, that's great. Unfortunately, the political reality in the United States is we're not gonna do that anytime soon. So the question is whether we're gonna do anything at all which is what essentially the, the last administration's position was uh, and you know, 20 years in the United States, or we're going to do what we can do, which is subsidize. And that's what we've seen in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we have to think about what the counterfactual is. Now, is the goal of the um, Inflation Reduction Act only to deal with these climate concerns? And the argument there is absolutely not. There's other elements in there as well. Some of them are the sort of standard jobs, industry, let's get some manufacturing here in the United States that's been hollowed out. Um, but there is a separate concern that I think is treated much more seriously in the United States than it is being in Europe right now, which is the resilient supply chain and not having all of these clean energy products being relied upon through China. And we've seen when it comes to the world, the economic world in which we're living, four or five years ago, even before Inflation Reduction Act, it was basically two worlds. It would be sort of the market-oriented approaches of the United States, Europe, Canada, and sort of the Western economies. And then there's the Chinese non-market economy approach. And we have seen what that has led to when it comes to the distribution of manufacturing activity globally. We now have a lot of concerns about the excessive concentration of certain activity um, in non-trustworthy partners. And we have seen China exert economic, acts of economic coercion, imposing export restrictions to favor its domestic industries. And so in light of, you know, and again, I guess for Europe, what I would say our analogy here in the United States is to say to Europe, look, you're a lot of your energy, you know, cleaner energy transition was going to be reliant on clean natural gas from Russia. That became an overdependence. And so when Russia decided to do something extremely hostile on foreign policy, military policy, that put Europe in a bad position. We now face a similar situation here in the United States with respect to China. We don't want to become overly reliant on things like batteries for electric vehicles uh, and all of the other pieces of the, of the green tra transition, in part because China has shown actions on the foreign policy side, nothing to do with economics, even the complicated uh, market economy, non-market economy issue that make the United States very, very nervous. So we are going to take actions to try to build a resilient supply chain outside of China wherever possible. We would love to do that with you. We would love to do that with our trusted allies and trading partners. But doing that, you can't follow WTO rules. I love the WTO, but we have to be honest None of this stuff, if you want to incentivize supply chains, uh, when one major economy is already subsidizing, you can't do it through non-discriminatory, non multilateral rules following policies. You've got to use discrimination. So the United States is doing that already through the Section 301 tariffs that the Trump administration imposed, and now these sorts of discriminatory subsidies. Um, but the key is, can we organize these subsidies in a way so that they are friend friendly, right? There were initial attempts to do that through the IRA 
it didn't quite get there. We have these provisions on um, electric vehicles for the, the consumer vehicle side that were not American assembly, it was North American assembly. So we did a little bit better than local content. There are parts in there for the electric, the battery supply chain uh, for free trade agreement partners in other countries, right? Even expanding beyond it. So it's not entirely local content, but we would need to do better. The question is doing better is gonna be hard uh, because it's going to involve re-engaging Congress on this issue, because this is a piece of legislation where this is just written down. The, the, the administration can't do it unilaterally. What they can do unilaterally is what was announced on December 29th. And so I think this shows their good faith at trying to do what they can. If you read the Treasury regulations, what they've basically said is uh, you can now, if you're a consumer, perhaps use this commercial vehicle track within the clean Ener within the Inflation Reduction Act to go lease a car, an electric vehicle, and none of the sourcing requirements actually apply. So, you know, you can go and if, if, if leasing a car now, a Volkswagen or a Porsche or, a, you know, whatever uh, clean energy vehicle might be, might be coming out of Europe could fall under that provision of the, of the IRA now. So in a sense, where they had discretion in writing the regulations, they tried desperately hard to do what allies like Europe wanted them to do in that instance. And importantly, if this actually works, it pokes a huge hole in their other objective, which was to force the supply chain out of China because none of the battery sourcing requirements and all of the stuff that says you can't have, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80% of, of, of content be non-Chinese over the next couple of years, none of that applies under the commercial vehicle track, right? So the United States is, is I think the administration is working hard on this issue. I'm discouraged on when I hear European, especially policymakers and politicians arguing that the United States uh, is just trying to steal European industries. I don't think that's the intention at all. We're very much interested in building out a resilient supply chain outside of China. Yes, that's the case. And we're willing to work with our friends and allies to try to do so. But it is going to require WTO inconsistent policies because there is this major non-market economy out there that's already down that path. And so we can't be naive. We have to figure out how to do this together. Whether or not we can do so, okay. But then that's partly, and this is where I'll end, partly a European choice, right? About prioritizing multilateral rules, not enforcing uh, market economy rules with, when it comes to res with respect to China, and ultimately perhaps uh, putting national security concerns and resilience concerns at risk as well. And so that's what I see are kind of the key trade-offs and the differences facing your European policymakers and American policymakers at this moment, at least when it comes to the IRA, and I'll reserve comment on on um, on, on steel and aluminum, all those and all those other items for until later. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chad. Uh, very interesting insights there from from the U.S. perspective, and uh, yeah, it, it seems like the the good old uh, Europeans are from Venus, Americans are from Mars, almost perspective that. You know, you have the more realist uh, uh, bilateral uh, approach rather than the multilateral European one. And if, if it's really the case that we see some sort of uh, watering down of the discriminatory um, elements of the IRA towards uh, the European Union, of course, that would be very welcome, I suppose. Um, I'm now turning uh, to Elitza. Um, Elitza, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about what does all of this mean for the broader transatlantic and global and tr global trade and climate policy? Um, what are, for example, the, the consequences for industry on both both sides of the Atlantic? Um, and yeah, what what are your predictions uh, going forward? Thanks so much, Philip. I'm not sure I'm going to finish with any predictions today. I mean, it's too early in 2023, but I'll do my best. Um, it is hard to follow after Chad and some of the gloomy, uh, we cannot do this within the WTO, but I'll try. Um, so maybe to follow up directly on Matthias's point on um, the discussion about the IRA really launched or relaunched the fundamental debate within the EU of whether we actually 
are able to and should be doing the same thing that the US is doing. Um, and in short, um, I think that this is distracting us from a much bigger fundamental debate about how to link climate and trade objectives together. Um, and that's why I really welcome what Matthias said about the initiative on sustainable trade. And I don't think that we're starting from a blank page. So I think I'm going to focus on three things slightly different from what I thought originally I'm going to talk about, Philip, so sorry. Uh, I think that I want to start filling in that blank page on the initiative and what um, EU US could be talking about when they talk about sustainable trade. Um, talk a little bit about the WTO and then bring in the wider context that Philip mentioned, but from the point of view from developing countries that um, we should still think about even if we're talking about the transatlantic trade agenda. Um, so to, to be fairly brief so that we leave time for, uh, for questions, on the first point in terms of how do we fill in the, uh, the blank page on sustainable trade, I think that and it's not noble anymore, is to look at um, all of the all of the different um, um, points of view um, about how we bridge um, the, or entangle better uh, the environmental and the trade regimes and the different things that they stand for. And it seems that one of the objectives that we know that it's inherent in the environmental regime that used to be inherent also in the train regime, the multilateralism uh, is one of the things that is becoming very problematic now. So it is one of the essential pillars of how we deal with environmental issues um, and less so with how we deal with trade policy issues nowadays. So in order to bridge these together, I think that one of the tracks that uh, really the sustainable trade initiative should be promoting is what that um, what is still feasible on that multilateral level, and how do we still keep um, keep progress um, in that regard? Whether it's through the different roles of the uh, WTO, um, even if it's um, just on agreement of a set of principles, common approaches, exchange of information, but taking that a track of um, track going. Um, in terms of what we can learn also from the environmental um, from the environmental regime and how things are done there, we should still keep in mind that um, in terms of um, environmental commitments, we um, there is a lot more recognition that there should be um, differential treatment of different countries, that national commitments are the starting point. And this is where um, EU's, um, some of EU's most recent initiatives have been really targeted. And that's really uh, the big, um, if, if you're a European, you, you become a little bit upset because uh, the US comes in and launches this subsidy package, uh, but actually the Europeans are targeted for CBAM and for deforestation packages and for some of the other things. And you start thinking, why are they not blaming the US for uh, ruining multilateralism? Um, but, but that's because nobody holds the US to, to those standards anymore. The EU is still, um, and that's where one of the, the other points lies, that we are still uh, responsible for keeping the rules-based system in place. Uh, because it is inherently linked also to our single market. And we see this with the fundamental debate within the EU, that as soon as we start talking about green subsidies and subsidies in order to try to outcompete and outmatch the US and China, we start talking about our single market. And then we start talking about who can provide the most subsidies in the single market. And it's not it's um, it's not surprising that it's all over the news right now because I think it's a fundamental problem of how we how we deal with this. Uh, and we cannot say that um, for us, um, this is not um, for this, that for us, this is an easy task and it's only a matter of deciding what kind of subsidies is, uh, is the way forward. Um, in terms of um, what else we can, we can learn from the environmental debate that we know should be included in the sustainable trade uh, discussion is also um, the, uh, one of the main issues around um, um, the old age debate about kicking down the ladder when it comes to the feelings of uh, developing countries of the actions of the EU and the US, uh, and especially of some of EU's um, most recent initiatives. So one of the things that it's obvious with, with this discussion is that um, one of the points on that transatlantic initiative agenda should be how should the revenues of initiatives like CBAM uh, and some of um, US's initiatives be uh, progressively used to help develop countries in their transitions. Um, and here we have three, three key points. So the first is about the priorities here are really on transformation. So helping um, developing countries accelerate their um, energy transformation 
particular deployment of renewables. Then the second is on mitigation and adaptation uh, in terms of protecting the livelihoods of the poor communities, poorest communities, and then uh, enhancing biodiversity and conserving the ecosystem. So this is not, again, these are all things that are already out there um, and we don't have to start from scratch. So these are priorities that have been around and have been discussed by um, environmental um, experts and also trade experts for a long time. So there is definitely uh, a firm ground to step on um, on those priorities. Um, so one of the things that Chad uh, raised is um, the other the other point here, which is um, securing EU supply chains uh, when it comes to critical raw materials. That's uh, that's probably uh, one of the uh, again uh, a tough uh, a tough um, um, thing to be uh, seeing from from the US in terms of um, how to was saying how quickly we managed to deal with some of the repercussions of the energy crisis. Um, but at the same time, um, trying to build um, an energy transformation that is going to require a lot more raw materials that we have access to right now. Um, so one of the, the problems of the IRA is that it makes us really wonder whether we're going to have access to the different materials that we're going to need by 2060 to, to, to do that kind of transformation. Um, and maybe just to uh, wrap up, um, as I mentioned, I think that the WTO is still um, uh, a key a key forum in order to discuss those topics. So in terms of the workings of the TBT committee, when it comes to uh, discussing, um, notifying existing measures, discussing the implications, implications of different measures, um, also in terms of the notifications of subsidies, which of course is already um, already happening, but this is um, this still remains to be a priority forum to um, uh, to bring those um, uh, those topics to. So I think it shouldn't be disregarded so quickly. <laughs> thanks, Philip. Yeah, thanks very much, Elitza, uh, also for you know broadening the discussion a little bit and looking also at uh, all the different issues that are actually involved and also the global perspective, uh, looking at uh, development uh, states and so on. Um, uh, Peter, um, now we've been looking at this trade and sustainability nexus that clearly is very uh, closely linked, but uh, how does that fit in the broader into broader topics like security, uh, economic security, uh, but also uh, prosperity and, and, and values uh, across the Atlantic, but uh, in global economies as well. Thank you, Philip. Uh, good to be here with everyone. Um, yes, I do think that what we're seeing is that some uh, issues that were mostly implicit uh, for many years, but were always there, are becoming explicit. And what I mean is that um, the trade policy, to my mind, has always had to be a balancing act among pursuing prosperity, in other words, economic efficiency, economic growth, um, promoting certain values, in other words, which would take expression in sort of rules and norms for how, how we trade, and also security, um, you know, investing in political relationships and institutions that further the national interest. I think these were always there, but because we had a certain kind of political constellation and a certain kind of globalization, they were implicit. I think that in part because of the rise of China's status economy and the challenge it provides to, um, to Western market economies, but also because of the climate emergency, we're seeing this issue become very explicit, this fact that trade always has to be a balancing act. Um, and um, and I think that that sustainability and climate are you could say that's that is a, a symptom of this, but also a driver of this uh, more explicit way of looking at trade policy. And some of the ways that it is driving this debate have been mentioned: uh, the uh, EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, the USU negotiations on a global arrangement for steel and aluminum. Uh, uh, I would say unilaterally, the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, and also parts of the U.S. EU um, Trade and Technology Council, including this new initiative on on sustainable trade. Um, and I, but and as I think also has been mentioned, one problem here is, th in my view, that the that while the World Trade Organization I think was you know a huge accomplishment and still has huge potential. Um, I don't think its rules have kept up with the need to combat climate change. 
uh, or you could say that at least its rules are too ambiguous, I think. And if you look at the exceptions that are in Article 20 for the environment, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure they would stand up to every challenge we can imagine to national government's um, climate measures under, under dispute settlement. Um, and and I think that uh, the U.S. and the EU um, um, should commit themselves together more to reform the WTO so those rules on on the environment are are become more clear. It's also true, I think, that uh, that would be a long process, and by the time uh, any meaningful reform is achieved, a lot of damage can be done to the climate. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing increasing pressure, domestic pressures and increasing actions by governments to take actions below the multilateral level, whether that's unilaterally, bilaterally, uh, or plurilaterally. And in plurilaterally, I would mention something like the uh, climate club idea that the German G7 uh, presidency has uh, championed, and which I think is still out there as, as an idea. And that it's no surprise that some of these issues, I, uh, some of these approaches Maybe already, uh, I don't going to say there always will, but they 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 always may come into conflict with with multilateral rules. Um, and I do think that the U.S. and the EU are the key drivers of this dynamic, where values and security and and prosperity are all being looked at, and where we're trying to find the right balance. So I do think what the U.S. and the EU do together will pretty much be determinative of of where we end up. Um, and I think that if they are able to together find a reasonably cooperative way to deal with this issue, that that will, on balance, kind of reinforce a an orderly global economy. But if they aren't, that would just add to the kind of um, anarchy we're beginning to see. Um, and, and one reason I say that is that... Um, what, when we talk about having a kind of rule, high standard, rules-based, orderly global economy, I think it's it's getting to be pretty important not to take a too institutionalist view of what that means. And what I what I mean by that is that it's not going to be all about the WTO, even though, as I said, we should try to make sure it has a role. I think we you know governments need to invest in other ways to preserve a kind of high standard orderly global economy. And, um, you know, they sort of governments need to hedge their bets. Uh, and um, I also think still it is the case, maybe it's a bit optimistic, maybe it's long-term, but I think it's also still the case that if the US and EU invest in these bilateral or plurilateral approaches to, to trying to make trade work on behalf of the climate, that could still produce some leverage that may be useful in the longer term in the multilateral context. Now, I think the jury is still out on this. Um, I, you know, we have some of the issues, some of the um, uh, ways, uh, forces for convergence have been mentioned. Uh, I do think that of the, the two that are most noteworthy, of is one is this, this initiative of unsustainable trade still needs to be fleshed out. But that looks pretty um, positive. Some, and I think the other one is, are the negotiations on uh, on a steel and aluminum arrangement, which would find a joint U.S. EU way to treat st imported steel that is both uh, unfairly produced, meaning subsidized, and also produced in a way that's not climate friendly. On the other hand, we definitely see some uh, trends towards fragmentation transatlantically. Uh, I think that. Um, there's a risk that, that the IRA has certainly already contributed to, to that to some degree. Chad pointed out some ways that I think some helpful ways that the Biden administration has reduced the uh, ways that the IRA could fragment the transatlantic relationship. I would say there is probably still some opportunity to reduce that further. For example, um, if the Treasury Department in March uh, comes out with a definition of what a free trade agreement partner is that is more expansive, that would also help. I think on that, I would say that when you look at the Biden administration, which has said that it doesn't want to pursue any new traditional free trade agreements that include market access, uh, it would be somewhat understandable if the Treasury came up with a definition of a free trade agreement or a free trade agreement partner that is also somewhat untraditional. Um, and I, I think that would, wouldn't wouldn't stretch the bounds of credibility too much. I think that that you need to think about 
free trade, both in, in a de jure way, but also in a de facto way. And I think that if, for example, the U.S. and the EU really pursue the Trade and Technology Council's goals to their logical ends, you are going to see more trade between the U.S. and the EU. You will see a kind of de facto market opening because they'll end up trading more with each other. They'll end up having supply chains more with each other and less with other countries. So I think that uh, I hope there's some room to describe a free trade agreement partner in a more expansive de facto way, given the fact that this administration isn't committed to any new free trade agreements in the classical definition. So that means that new partners wouldn't be, there are no new partners on tap to take advantage of the of the uh, more favorable, ter favorable terms under the IRA. Now, the the other possibly uh, the other possible effort that could lead to greater transatlantic fragmentation is um, I, I, I say this with some caution, but that I would say is the is the CBAM. Uh, I think the the European Commission has been very careful about trying to design it so that it is consistent with WTO rules, and I you know I think they should deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, I'm not an expert on WTO law, but I would say that. I would say two things. I'd say one that it would be for, a, for a, a sort of political terms for the for the value of the relationship. It would certainly be helpful if the EU and its in the final uh, language on the CBAM could find a way to account for a country like the United States, which uses. Um, regulation and incentives to reach its climate goals rather than price, because as Chad pointed out, that's just politically sort of, an, uh, you know, in no go, a no go area in the United States. Um, but I also just raise the question of whether or not it's whether or not it's discriminatory um, to uh, only only give um, Kind of to give sort of preferential treatment to economies that base their climate protection on price and not on regulation or incentives. I just think that is something we're thinking about. Although, as I say, I think that you know the commission should be commended for trying to design the CBAM uh, in a way that is WTO consistent. So just the last thought would be that in terms of tr looking forward and how the US and the EU can manage their relationship and also try try to reduce the amount of tensions and stresses put upon the global trading system i would say a kind of a kind of bargain could be that um, the US on its for its side um, really makes a much stronger commitment to working with the EU to reform the WTO. I um, mean, one way I could think of is, for example, to add climate to the trilateral initiative that the US and the EU and Japan have. You know, that's something that's already on the shelf. So I think the Biden administration, I think it would be helpful if the Biden administration was clear that it actually wanted to work through the WTO, try to reform it to make it much clearer what is is climate, what, what you know, what actions can be taken or not if easy to be the climate. I think also, on the other hand, I think it would be helpful if, if, if the EU or other countries sort of ceased and desist from any cases against the U.S. on the IRA. Uh, I would I would be concerned that the you know that the U.S. could be tempted to invoke national security for for its climate actions. It'd be much better if the U.S. I think invoked Article 20 and said we're doing this because we you know there's an environmental exception in the in the um, in the WTO. But you have you have seen some people over the past couple of years uh, you know share their view that perhaps uh, whether it's in U.S. law or in WTO law that the, that the national security exception could be some way to to justify climate actions. I think that's more. Um, that could result in more stresses to the system because that's a kind of get out of jail free card, which can be used in all occasions, whereas using an environmental exception is, of course, by definition, more narrow. So I think it has less presents less risk of stressing the system. But I think this kind of, there are some ways that in the short term that the U.S. and the EU could kind of decide to uh, either step up or step back from certain kind of actions that I think would help the relationship, but also the global economy. Yeah, Peter, thanks very much. Uh, that was very interesting uh, to see, of course, the different approaches, more the rule-based versus the subsidy-based approach to, um, uh, yeah, to, to, to sustainability politics, um, and also the, um, yeah, the larger questions of, uh, of uh, security, uh, prosperity, and so on. Um, there's always uh, this debate uh, going on right now uh, uh, that, uh, Okay, the IRA, it's, it's a huge chunk of money. It's, uh, it's very concentrated. And, 
actually uh, it is, uh, yeah, in, in, from the European point of view, often described as something much bigger than that's actually used uh, in when it comes to subsidies or green subsidies in the EU. And there's another point of view that says that there's actually so many programs already in the EU uh, that uh, of, whether it's the EIB, the uh, Green Deal, um, uh, Green Deal initiatives, uh, the RRF, and so on. Uh, and uh, this uh, argument goes that uh, this is actually uh, already uh, enough or, or even uh, at the same level or higher than the, 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 the US. Uh, and that the real thing that should be done is more sort of a reform uh, of regulatory, uh, um, decreasing regulatory burden, making things more uh, transparent and so on. Um, I would like to ask one of the European uh, participants of the panel uh, what their view on this uh, argument is. Maybe Matthias, you want to go ahead? Yeah, no, it's... Um, I think, I think first of all, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, point of view, yeah. Um, I think it's quite clear that that subsidies um, is is an important policy tool for uh, for public authorities to uh, to help the economy go forward and also to to tackle uh, specific challenges. Um, industrial policy is uh, is clearly something that is uh, a mainstream of. Um, of 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 the big economic entities uh, in uh, in in the world, China is trying to drive forward its uh, its, its aircraft sector, its uh, its steel and aluminium sector, its uh, solar panels. Um, and in the U.S., uh, industrial policy is not a four-letter word anymore. It's not me saying that; it's uh, the Biden administration saying that. Um, I think. I think that's uh, that's uh, and that I mean coming from Europe, you know, that the state is uh, is supporting uh, certain areas of the economy. Um, if I would say that that was not normal, uh, well, I would not have lived in the European Union for some time, I guess. Huh? But I think the the key difference we see here uh, with what the U.S. is doing is that um, what we are doing, uh, the subsidies in the EU, uh, are not discriminatory and they are not distortive and. I can say that with confidence because um, we have to respect the very strong rules that we have in the EU uh, to uh, in, in that in that respect. Um, and I think I, in many ways, I, I, I can I can share what or what Chad said on on the need to 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 avoid being uh, uh, overly dependent on unsure uh, supply chains and to be resilient. I think. Uh, I couldn't agree more, actually. Um, but I fail to understand how um, it makes our uh, resilience stronger on both sides of the Atlantic to create incentives in this, with the American subsidies, which make the EU economy weaker, huh? uh, which makes it more difficult for EU and uh, US uh, supply chains to be to be integrated because there'll be a pull towards making this investments in the in, in the US. And which, in the end, might make the EU more dependent on China huh? uh, than, than, than it was before. And I, I find that I find that I find that uh, regrettable. I also understand that we need to be. Um, I'm speaking very much in a personal capacity here, but I think it's quite clear that we need to be creative to ensure that uh, the environmental reactions, uh, that, that the environmental, that the necessary environmental actions that we take are not unnecessarily challenged in the WTO. The WTO was created in, in the beginning of the 90s. Intellectually, it was shaped in the, in, the, in, in the 80s. It's quite clear that it needs an update in many ways. But we believe that there's a possibility to work on that. Um, and, and, but, but if we have that problem in relation to, to China, um, if the U.S. perceives that there's a problem in terms of what he wants to do uh, on, on, on supply chains with China, I do not understand. Uh, what we fail to understand is why does it have to be through action where the collateral damage is the trade relation with the EU, the trade investment relation with the EU, but not only with us. 
but with the 50% of world trade that the U.S. has with other partners, or 60% of world trade that they are that the U.S. has with other partners than uh, China uh, and and the EU. Um, we subsidize. If we look at the uh, Chips Act, for example, we have a Chips Act on 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 our side. We have a Chips Act on the U.S. side. Okay, we're putting a lot of money. Well, well, this is a good decision or not? I'm not saying, but we have decided that politically we have to put a lot of money into the chips, into into semiconductors, because we do not want to be either uh, dependent on China or dependent on a piece of land which is very close to China and which might be invaded. <laughs> you know, uh, but they're non-discriminatory. Huh? And it's true that we do subsidize a lot, for example, electric cars uh, here in Europe, but it's non-discriminatory. Which are the two biggest selling electric cars in Europe the last year? That's right. Huh? Uh, so, so, so w w I think where, where the lack of understanding is, why does the US, when it says it has to be resilient, it has to have predictable supply chains, it has to avoid dependence in his energy uh, production of unreliable partners, why does the EU end up in the same bucket as China and uh, and maybe, maybe Russia? I think that's a fundamental question. And maybe finally, there's been a lot said about what uh, what 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 has been taken, what the, the the decisions that have been taken by the by the administration uh, in terms of mitigating the negative effects of the IRA. I think we have seen that it's positive i think there's been a positive steps i'm not sure how much more it would be than tinkering around the edges huh? and i understand that because the u.s administration has to respect the decisions by the u.s legislative i mean that is that is a, that is that is a, that is a, that is a, that is a, that is a democratic situation that's a democratic system it's like cbam if u.s believes that there's a problem with cbam it will not be a uh, but it would not be an excuse for the commission to say, oh, but that's what the council and the parliament decided. No, we have to face the music towards the outside. And that's what the U.S. administration has to do. I, I can't see how it can be uh, an argument that, okay, this was a legislative in, 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 in the U.S. What I feel is, and I think that's worrying, is that the issue of the WTO compatibility in respect of other, part, uh, of other training partners who play by the rules and where there's a level playing field, uh, that that seems to be less and less a concern in uh, in, in 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 the U.S. That, that 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 that's a concern. That's a concern for me. Or maybe I strayed a bit away from the from the, from the question of the the initial the beginning. Um, but I think uh, I think those are some of the those are some of the, the some of the key points. Yeah. Thanks very much. I think this uh, was very interesting to have this sort of dialogue between the U.S. and uh, the EU going on, and that's why. I would also ask Chad if you would would like to come back in on the comments of Matthias. Yeah, absolutely. And I want so I want to address specifically this point that Matthias just raised, and as well as that Alitza raised, because I think it's there's a key fundamental misunderstanding in and what the United States is intending, um, and the way that Europe is perceiving it. And so also before I get there, yes, I agree. Tesla is selling a lot of cars in Europe right now, but they are not, not being imported from the United States. They're either being manufactured in Europe or they're now being imported from China. So again, we're talking about trade. Yeah, it's Tesla, it's a brand. But if you look at the data, we're no longer exporting those from the United States anymore. So this is, this is part of the issue. Okay, specifically, on the battery electric vehicle supply chain components, right? There are these parts that are really specific that say uh, in order for um, the electric vehicle battery manufacturers to get credit for these tax credits in the United States market, the supply chains essentially cannot go through China, which essentially makes today everyone ineligible for that piece of the tax credits because all of the supply chains for lithium, cobalt refining, all of this stuff go through China. And the United States has effectively said in the future, if we don't do something about that, that's where we will end up for lots of other things, you know, rare earths, PPE, right? Where we were headed with semiconductor, you know, all this kind of stuff. So we want to head that off. So we're going to build in these specific uh, incentives to try to create an additional redundant supply chain that is outside of China. 
that, if it ultimately is created, is not going to create an even more dependence of Europe on China. It's going to give Europe access to a second supply chain. There's nothing in the IRA that says, if you build you know, lithium processing facilities or cobalt or what have you to supply vehicles made in North America to get the tax credit, you can't also supply vehicle manufacturers in Europe. Of course they can. And now Europe has benefited from the fact that there is this second supply chain in addition to the original one that was going through China. So I don't understand this argument. Sorry, I'm being passionate here. I don't understand this argument that we're making the Europeans more reliant on China. We're creating an additional supply chain and in fact, giving you more economic leverage over China in the future because they won't be you know, the sole source of, of, these, of these kinds of things. Now, I do understand completely the argument right, that the, the, the EU really can't just sit there and do nothing now. And you're being put in this unfortunate or uncomfortable, I guess, situation. You had this path. You thought it was going to be fit for 55, phasing out the, the, the ETS um, provisions, the licenses, the free licenses, CBAM, that was going to be our path. And with Inflation Reduction Act now, maybe that's no longer on the table and you have to, you have to redo things. So I, I see that there's basically three approaches that Europe could take at this point. It could go with local content, sort of like the way the United States has, has initially done, which is we're trying to claw back, right, certain elements of that, in which uh, in order to get eligibility for subsidies in Europe, they have to be, things have to be done in Europe. That's bad. We don't want that. We, that's race to the bottom, right? We don't want that. You don't want that. We could figure out how to do this together in which you don't have local content either, and we don't have local content either. We have joint content, or as Peter suggested, free trade agreement or some creative version of content. Or you do nothing, which maybe is politically, institutionally where, where things end up. But then even if so, on certain of these elements, um, the work that the United States is doing to try to create an additional supply chain, which is discriminatory, as I said, requires discriminatory policy, is going to create some additional benefits for Europe. And lastly, on industrial policy, and as an economist, I, I can't believe I have to you know, articulate for industrial policy here and advocate for it. Again, this is a lot, not my positions on things, but just trying to explain the American position because I think there's so much um, misunderstanding here. What the United States effectively has done with the IRA is not picked winners. The IRA is actually pretty technologically neutral in terms of laying out the incentives. And even on the electric vehicle issue, because the subsidies feed through consumers, it's ultimately going to be what consumers want to buy. Now, ultimately, because of the local content provisions, they end up looking like production subsidies. I, I agree with that. But it's not as if the US government is picking particular production facilities and say, we're going to subsidize that one you know, we're, we're, we're picking winners. And so it, when it comes to industrial policy, if you're going to do it, at least this is in some sense, not that bad. It can, it can do better. And I think there are definitely efforts within on the U.S. side to try to make it more Europe friendly. Right. But this is sort of where we are at the moment. Thanks very much, uh, Chad, uh, for, for the very interesting insights again. Um, I was wondering maybe, uh, Elisa, if you would like to come in on that, uh, you you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I, I think definitely option number one, the chat outline, um, uh, yeah, sounds uh, horrific. Uh, so definitely that's, um, I don't think it should be an option. Um, and option number two does seem to be one of the things that is on the table. Um, so I'm really, really happy about that. Um, and when it comes to um, uh, what Chad was saying in terms of our perception from Europe. So I do agree that we we might slightly um, over exaggerate things at times because the US has always been an attractive market and even more so with lower energy prices and with the size of the market, with the skilled workforce, it already had um, quite a few interesting selling points when it came to the uh, to the green transition in terms of um, attracting investment. And that, as Matthias pointed out, is the strongest investment relationship in the world. Um, so the US is already a key market for, um, for EU companies in terms of their investment decisions. So maybe we're slightly, it's just coming at a particularly bad time, as Chad said, that um, we have to be facing 
um, we have to be facing that array when we are trying to pull together uh, a response to all of these other challenges. So as we said, the climate emergency, the critical raw materials issue, uh, we have um, the crisis of multilateralism. So we have all of these uh, different points that we are trying to, to fight at different fronts and having to reshift all of our focus to the IRA is just unfortunate. Um, but we are already doing quite a lot at the um, at the European level to try to pull together, I think, um, internal um, internal and external synergies and sort of mapping what internal policies do we have and how can we make this um, sort of work for us also with our external relations. So one of the things that we um, we were hopefully going to see more of this year without the IRA was, um, again, our return to trade and investment agreements and trying to do a big push on some of those that are on the agenda and maybe trying to include in some of them more focus on the raw materials diplomacy and the issues around critical raw materials and trying to um, focus some of those relationships on the things that matter on the critical raw materials front, uh, on the energy front, on the and then the topics that um, that really matter at the minute. Um, and so all of this is now put sort of at the back foot. Um, another point that was really important um, last year, and we were hoping to see more of in 2023, is on implementation enforcement. So there are, again, a lot of initiatives in the EU, both in the internal market and also externally, um, in terms of even making access to some of those loans more accessible or uh, stimulating a bigger spread across the EU rather than um, such over-focus on just some countries performing better when it comes to absorption, um, but also on the external front, implementation enforcement of sustainability commitments on the external front. And um, that's that's one thing that I really um, like looking at in terms of how those relationships we have with partners around the world really help us with our climate ambitions in terms of the uh, progress we've made with FTAs, but also on the plurilateral agendas. Um, so there are plenty of things to to do without having to go on a full race to the bottom for sure. And it really it starts at home with doing that um, sort of just sitting for a second and doing a full map of what kind of uh, resources do we have internally and what synergies it has with our external policies and how do we do the best of um, some of the some of the initiatives we took uh, for COVID and that we can really build on this year. So. I think there were plenty of interesting things that were supposed to happen in 2023. So we are slightly um, off track. <laughs> Thanks very much, Elitza. Um, um, Peter, if you want to have uh, a last uh, statement, um, you're very welcome. I would also like uh, to uh, pay, uh, make people pay attention that they can still ask questions. And uh, I would um, turn to, to QA uh, after, after Peter's last statement. And of course, people online are also very much encouraged to, to, to send their questions in. So uh, yeah, Peter, the floor is yours. Just very quickly, um, two thoughts. One, one is that the IRA, it seems to me, may be posing challenges for the European auto industry. But if you look at some other manufacturing industries in Europe, there are some clear benefits and for them as companies and for the climate. And so I'd be interested to see an analysis which shows, which could show, you know, in net sort of, you know, is it is it more ben a plus for the European economy or, or a minus? I haven't seen that. It'd be interesting to see that. The second point I would make is that, um, I, you know, you're going to start to see more Chinese electric vehicles driving around the streets of Europe and maybe potentially the United States. And putting aside what, what the political reaction might be to that, just, you know, it seems to me that uh, perhaps it's the lesser of two evils is um, having um, uh, a you know strong, a, a, at least sort of a, a stronger U.S. component to the European electric vehicle um, ecosystem than 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 um, seeing um, and not having anything to compete with increasing Chinese presence. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Yes. Uh, Philip, Philip Blankensop, I'm a journalist with Reuters. Um, uh, Peter Rashish on the panel raised this idea that uh, the United States could kind of have a more flexible 
interpretation perhaps on what counts as a free trade partner. Uh, Matthias said he only really kind of saw sort of tinkering at the edges in terms of any kind of changes. I just wondered whether um, what you perhaps saw in terms of what those tinkering at the edges could be, and maybe, you know, maybe uh, the, pa the other panelists have this idea or could comment on this notion of a more flexible interpretation of uh, free trade partners in terms of a kind of an escape clause for the EU in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act. would like to reply to this question? Um, well, I, I think when I, when I say tinkering at the edges, it's because I feel that in the law itself, and I think I completely understand that the American administration has to uh, respect the law, there's an original sin, huh? uh, which is uh, which is the um, the local content and the local assembly uh, on the North American assembly uh, provisions and, and and those cannot be changed by executive action just in the way as I said you know if there's a law passed by the EU by the EU Parliament and uh, in Parliament and the, and the council we will have to implement it uh, in, a, in, a, in a faithful manner that's what that's what democracy is about um, I think it's uh, I think it's good that we've been able to find an arrangement on, uh, or that the U.S. has chosen to take uh, an interpretation in relation to commercial vehicles, which will uh, allow um, uh, a maximum of, uh, of of cross transatlantic trade on that. Uh, on FTA, whether the EU can be seen as an FTA partner. Again, it's a decision uh, for the U.S. administration to to take. I think it would help. Uh, also, it would be positive. <clears throat> but um, there's a whole range of uh, of other problems in uh, in the IRA, which uh, which will not be which it will not be possible to to change uh, in terms of uh, uh, having to use organized labor uh, uh, in the U.S. in terms of uh, Having uh, skilled labor, uh, I mean, there, there's a whole range. If you go, if you go through the, uh, if you go through the fact sheet, uh, and then I think that in then, then our submission uh, that we sent to to, to the U.S. Uh, last uh, last November, you will see the amount of uh, of, of concerns which will not be uh, addressed, uh, uh, which cannot be addressed, I think, by the by the by the U.S. Uh, administration. Still, I think we are very happy that we have a positive process now in terms of a task force uh, process um with the us um, um it had some it has had some good first results and we continue to working uh on we'll continue working with the us on this um there's a number of uh, of, of provisions of uh, implementation provisions that have come uh, that have to come out by uh, by uh, by um, by march i think uh, us president uh, biden recognized uh, that uh, the idea was not to hurt transatlantic uh, trade ties. Now, uh, if there's political will in the U.S. to uh, to try to 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 address some of those issues, mitigate them um, through uh, administrative uh, implementation uh, action, well, I think very much hope uh, to Umerich hope that this would be the case. I think it will depend very much on on, on political will in in the U.S., but. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, they will be able to to solve those issues. If you look at back at the past couple of years, we have uh, we have been able to navigate a couple of very difficult, delicate issues, either uh, late uh, things to 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 rest or park them or avoid it uh, uh, conflicts. For example, in the area of uh, digital services tax, uh, so so our our um, our uh, our basis is that we believe that we can go forward uh, positively on this within the limits that we understand that uh, that the US administration is working within and which 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 Chad uh, I think very eloquently described thank you very much um, I see we have some online questions as well now um, Thais van den Buske uh, is asking regarding the CBAM do the EU panelists agree with Chad Bowne 
that the EU may be able to give the US some leeway with exceptions, for, uh, for example, regulatory standards, or would they rather agree that uh, the legislative process is too far to accommodate the US significantly? <laughs> oh, go, go for it, Lisa. Yeah. No, I, I think it's very tricky. I think that that's that's uh, that's one of the the points in the um, in, in one of the points that will be we'll see during the CBAM transition is um, how exactly the final shape of CBAM will uh, will will plan out. But as it stands, uh, there is nothing resembling a mutual recognition agreement where we would be able to have. Um, a standard to compare the processes that are under um, or the, the process that we are using in the EU with the CBAM, with the regulatory practice that is used in, in the US and elsewhere. And it's, again, another can of worms. So if uh, the EU agrees to, to, um, uh, to accept um, the US's uh, regulatory practice as equivalent in some way or in order for it to not fall within the CBAM remit, then a lot of other countries will, will follow suit. Uh, and then it already seems that there will be uh, quite a few challenges to the CBAM. So um, I'm not sure that that's the right, uh, the, the right step um, at the minute. Um, so, um, but the CBAM can definitely serve as a, um, as a um, discussion platform in order to to discuss what are some of the commonalities between the different approaches and try to establish certain things about measurement. How do we measure um, uh, embedded uh, carbon in in goods? What do we do in terms of environmental trade in goods and services? Uh, how do we treat export rebates? So there is a, a set of issues that we're actually launching the CBAM now without having a response to all of those questions. So it is a good point to sit with the US during the discussions within the Sustainable Trade Forum and try to establish some agreement on, on, on some of these things, including uh, how, to be, how to make these initiatives more inclusive, how to make the process more transparent, allow access to other countries to comment on these things. Also to make sure that the revenue, as I mentioned earlier, is, um, is distributed in certain ways uh, that it also helps broadly um globally the the climate transition um so that would be um just some initial thoughts thank you elitza uh any more questions yeah uh, my name is justina balbier i work for hydro the largest european aluminium company I have a question to Mr. Jorgensen. Um, you have mentioned the GASA negotiations, the Global Arrangement on Sustainable Steel and Aluminium. I would like to ask whether you could disclose a little bit more about the direction uh, of these negotiations. Um, has, for example, IRA affected uh, these negotiations in any way? And also as uh, the WTO compatibility has been uh, put into question in this meeting, I was wondering how important uh, it will be for the European Commission um, in these negotiations, especially if some specific trade measures such as tariffs are um, are proposed. Thank you. Any questions, huh? You're gonna... <laughs> um, but um, yeah, uh, I think the, the, the GSA uh, negotiations are, are, are very important for us to try to uh, conclude successfully. Um, the reason is that uh, if we don't do it, we have the risk of, uh, again, uh, putting uh, tariffs on in both directions, and that's not something that's good for, for EU uh, US trade. It's quite clear that uh, given the, uh, uh, given the uh, integration of EU US trade links, it's extremely difficult, probably impossible, I would say, and I'm speaking from experience actually, to find areas in which you will not hurt uh, very legitimate economic interests on both sides, whether you are stri whether you are hitting imports or, or, or exports, huh? um, so that's that's the first uh, important point. I think we will really do our maximum to uh, avoid a situation in which we will have to reimpose uh, tariffs. Um, for us, uh, when it comes to this GSA negotiations, I think that there, there, there are three there are three basic uh, tenants for us, and that is, and that is for the first first of all, we want to get rid of the uh, additional tariffs that the US imposed for security, uh, national security reasons. 
we believe that the steel and aluminium trade across the Atlantic has to be normalized. We don't see why there's there's no reason why it should not uh, take place according to the same WTO rules as all the other trades take is, is, is doing. The second is that whatever solution has to be found, um, whatever solution is being agreed, it has to be WTO compatible. Um, and that's that's quite that's quite important that's quite important for us. Um, and um, and 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 that's uh, that's something I think uh, that there's uh, that there's basic agreement with the U.S. on. Um, if one looks at the uh, declaration that we did in October 2021, I think there's either an implicit or an, or an explicit uh, reference uh, to that. And there's uh, there's nothing in the discussions with the uh, with the U.S. Uh, that has indicated uh, otherwise uh, until now. Also taking into account, I think the, the very valid point that both Peter and Chad has, uh, have done is, you know, that 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 we need maybe to look at environmental considerations in a slightly different manner. That when uh, when uh, the, when GATT was, then uh, when the WHO agreements were concluded or were agreed in 1992. Um, and the third point is uh, in this negotiation is that uh, for us it's very important that uh, whatever uh, agreement we get to. Um, with the US on, on, on GSA, uh, it safeguards uh, the uh, climate uh, uh, related legislation that we have in the EU, uh, for example, uh, CBAM. Um, and I think, I mean, I agree with Elitza when she says, I don't think there's a possibility for the US uh, to be exempted from CBAM. Uh, there is no ETS, uh, like uh, there's no carbon pricing mechanism inside the US. I don't expect there to be one. This doesn't mean uh, that we cannot work very closely to, with the US in the quite uh, significant transition period that we have to see what kind of uh, administrative or what kind of uh, uh, adjustments we can, you know, adjustments, you know, what kind of solutions we can find to, 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 to ensure that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that the US is treated uh, uh, fairly, and I mean again, CBAM is 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 plant based. Huh? And I mean, and I mean, just look at just look at uh, steel and aluminium. The general CO two CO two content of uh, of steel aluminium in the US is, is not higher than in the in the, that in the EU. It's probably lower in many ways, uh, in many areas. So so uh, I mean, I understand that there's a theoretical. It's maybe an in interesting theoretical WHO concern from the US side on uh, CBAM, which is interesting when you look at WHO, or sorry, US, uh, the direction of, of, of US policy on the WHO in general. But I think we still would need to see whether there are any concrete uh, concerns. But we're certainly very happy to sit down with the US and see how uh, they can best comply uh, with, uh, with CBAM, how we make it. The more easy, the, the, as easy as possible for 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 the firms. In uh, the in in the context of the whole work that we're now doing for 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 implementing CBAM, and there's a political agreement between the co-legislators, and that's done. Huh? Now there's a whole big uh, work in terms of implementing it, uh, methodologies, lots of things uh, that will that will that will uh, that will take place over the next couple of years. The fact that CBAM is not Entering into force overnight, uh, with all the details. I mean, there's a reason for it. There's a lot of quite complicated work that has to be uh, that has to be done by the Commission, by the EU, but certainly in uh, in, uh, in 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 contact with our trading partners. Thank you, Matthias. Um, any more questions? Thank you. Um, Ignacio from E3G, third generation environmentalism. Um, so a general question for the panel would be going back to IRA and the role of subsidies in the transition. So I would first say that I think subsidies will certainly play a role in the transition, that the current WTO rules probably do not, are not adapted well enough for the requirements of the climate transition, and that the current rules reflect the political consensus that is shared by developing countries, by broad uh, coalitions of countries in the world, because they're there to protect the weakest countries in the econ in the global economy, and thus that we need some sort of principles for the use of subsidies in the transition that take into account those views. So those would be, I think, the main way forward outside of the IRA conundrum in a sort of larger agenda. 
Um, my question would be, do you have any ideas of what those principles for the use of subsidies in the transition could look like? Where, where should we start looking? And, and a more specific question for Mr. Jorgensen would be on the uh, sustainable trade initiative. I don't we have to find an acronym for that one. Um, would that be a place to discuss those principles with the US? Is that going to be part of the agenda um, or not? Um, thanks. Maybe we take one more question because we're running out of time. So, um... Thank you. My name is Gil Rieklis. I'm an associate director here at the EPC. It's been a very interesting panel and discussion. Um, maybe a comment and something that feeds into the, the last question. I don't think this debate in Europe and in other countries on the IRA is exaggerated at all. I'm, my concern is quite the contrary, that there's no bargain in this and, and we're really trying to put lipstick here on the, on the really big uh, pig. Um, uh, on resilience, of course, everybody agrees on creating more resilience in supply chains, but I think the basic logic is that if one wants to create more resilience, the best answer, obviously, uh, to diversification is to lower trade barriers, uh, and in this case, to create a low barrier transatlantic space. But this is really the opposite course of action that's being taken. And, and I would say when I hear from Elitsa and, and also to some extent from Peter, one needs to, to work further through the WTO, that's the forum, uh, we need to invest in an orderly uh, international economy. Uh, I, what I hear really from the US IRA and from Chad is that WTO is no forum at all. Uh, the EU spent months trying to make the CBAM WTO compatible. It wasn't a discussion at all for the IRA. When we had the steel panel on the 9th of December, the answer in substance from the US TR was not only then to China, but also to Switzerland, to Norway, was get out of this space. So, so I'm, I'm very sort of the bigger pig here we're lipsticking or what I'm concerned about is, is really the US acting as a sort of a grave digger of, of the international trade system here. And, and of course, one can commit more to WTA rules, as you say, Peter, and, and I think there are ideas out there. One could, uh, in this climate and trade nexus, imagine something one did for agriculture back in the days, having a green box, an amber box, uh, a red box, uh, having specific rules for development countries. But the problem I see is that there's nobody to do this with anymore, uh, even if one would want them, want it on the, on the EU level. So, so, so I mean, I guess as a, to round it off, I mean. My worry here is that the EU is showing it's very capable to act in crisis towards Russia, uh, decoupling, etc. But I think there is per perhaps, a, a, and that's the storm, a bigger climate change here happen happening, which is the relationship with China and the US and the undermining of, of international rules and international uh, cooperation. It seems like we are in an age of confrontation, not only in security terms, but also in, in economic terms, and that really international cooperation and, 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 and rules are, are crumbling. And I'm wondering whether that isn't really what we should read into this IRA, and, and really that requires a tough conversation, first and foremost, and amongst Europeans, but also with other partners than not only the US. Thank you. Um... Who wants to take the two questions? Is there someone? I mean, I think you, Peter, you're you're most welcome. Um, I, I, you know, I would dispute that the Biden administration's the grave digger of the international economic system. I would say, if I had to think of an analogy or a metaphor, I, it's more like a night watchman who's got a call, you know, from his or her family saying there's an emergency at home, and and they, and the. There's a, so there's a the night watchman is very distracted, right? I, I don't think it's fair. To, I think so. That's yes, I would accept that that the U.S. administration is sort of distracted by these distracted in in you know in quotes by some urgent other urgent concerns whether they're domestic it's creating jobs domestically or whether it's climate change. So I, I mean that's that's how I read the Biden administration. Um, now the other I'd like to just make an answer about this question of of. Um, that you asked about um, uh, subsidies. Um, so I think that there's are, there seems to already be some activity on fossil fuel subsidies, right? You're seeing a small groups of countries uh, have some talks about that, trying to move the debate forward. Uh, and because, you know, there's, uh, it's, if, I'm, if I'm correct, you know, um, fossil fuels are much more, um, there are many more subsidies uh, for, for fossil fuels, or, or at least WTO law makes it easier to subsidize, I think I'm right, easier to subsidize fossil fuels than renewables. Um, so that needs to be sort of switched around. 
Now, you made this point about um, developing countries. Um, you know, uh, to the extent that a change in the rules governing fossil fuels would somehow, I mean, assuming that it could be harmful to the interests of developing countries, that seems to be yet another reason that the US, the EU, and other richer countries need to find some way to make good on their Paris commitments in terms of financing. Um, you know, the EU has not said that it's going to use any of its revenues from the CBAM to do that. Fair enough. There's also a lot of domestic. Uh, urgent domestic issues they have to attend to. I don't believe the U.S. has any kind of, you know, really any real mechanism for that either. But it, I mean, I do think um, that when you're talking about making changes that may be more to, in the interests of developed countries, which have a lot of renewable energy industries, and I'm not saying, I mean, I don't know enough about this issue, but it's the extent that it hurts the interests of develop. I do think it reinforces this issue of of making sure the financing is going in the right direction. Thanks very much. I see Chad also raised his arm, uh, his hand. He, you're welcome to come in, but I think uh, let's keep it short now because we're already over time. Yep. Um, so thanks, and I'll this I'll be very quick. So maybe three quick points here uh, on that last comment. I think this is the the key question um, that Americans, Washington, and again, this isn't Chad, but this I'm trying to present Washington here to to, to my friends in Europe is why don't you see China? Why do you lump us in with China as opposed to lumping China in with Russia? We see China, the China threat, authoritarianism, uh, economic coercion, potentially exploiting a supply chain in, in the fear of that in much the same way as what you just went through with Russia. Shouldn't we be working together to try to prevent that kind of thing? Because um, we have the same kind of interest in mind. But to do that, this question of, and again, I'm an economist, I generally agree that improving supply chain resilience for a lot of instances, a lot of countries out there would be lowering trade barriers. Perhaps for the United States, Europe, China, the, the mass majority of economic activity in the global trading system, not the case anymore. We have seen an incredibly efficient supply chain emerge, but that leads because of economic forces to the concentration of certain amounts of economic activity geographically. And in a new world where we have climate shocks pandemic health shocks, let alone geopolitical shocks in, in countries using economic coercion, having excessive geographic concentration of economic activity in certain places of the world, especially in China, is just not responsible for policymakers anymore. But lowering trade barriers further is not going to change that locus of economic activity. What will, what firms and industries respond to are economic incentives that come through policy but that requires discriminatory policy. That requires things like subsidies, tariffs, what the United States has done, and some of these local content, regional content, friend content sorts of provisions. And unfortunately, that's sort of the reality of economics. Um, and, and I think that's, that's what we sort of have to confront, at least as part of this conversation and actually get to the point of kind of what we're debating about and talking about in future, thanks. Thank you, Chad. And with that, I would like to conclude uh, this very interesting policy dialogue. Thanks first uh, to uh, the four um, panelists. It was very interesting uh, to see these, uh, um, yeah, the, the views from EU and US uh, so directly uh, being exchanged. And uh, yeah, uh, finally, also thank you uh, um, to everyone who came, uh, took the time to come to the EPC, and of course, to everyone online who followed uh, for taking the time and uh, listening in on this uh, very interesting and insightful discussion. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.